I want your soul. The distress call came how long ago? I asked the commanding officer as I suited up. Twenty minutes ago. The crew was on a mission in the sub when something went wrong and they sent a distress signal. They went radio silence since then. The officer gave me a stern look, which told me to hurry up. What was the depth? Jackson, my mission partner, asked. Around 1,500 meters. The sub is a new type and was designed to go down to 2,000 meters, so even if they sank further down due to malfunction or exterior damage, they should be okay, since the bottom is roughly 1,800 meters below surface. Your mission is to rescue any survivors. In case there are no survivors, assess the damage to the sub and secure the black box. Any idea on what caused them to send the distress signal? I asked. Nah, not sure, the commander responded. This is what they sent. He pulled out a small device and clicked a button. A panicked voice started speaking over the device. This is S-158. We have a hull breach and are in need of immediate rescue. We are southwest of your position, distance unknown, depth 1,500 meters. Send the... And then the voice cut out. You'll have a GPS tracker in your submersible, which should locate the sub. He then put away the device. Jackson and I jumped inside the vessel. The dolphin, as it was dubbed, was able to withstand a tremendous amount of pressure and go down to 6,000 meters. It was not originally designed for search and rescue, but due to the urgency of the situation, HQ had no choice but to let us man this vehicle. The backside of the submersible had a depressurization chamber which could attach to any other submersible externally and transport staff in and out. We'll keep in touch via comms. Get moving, the commander said, and we closed the hatch, muffling the outside noises. Jackson and I sat in our seats and got ready to dive. His job was to pilot the vehicle and mine to operate the depressurization chamber. Jackson pressed some buttons on the machine and the submersible hummed to life. Various screens started glowing, showing depth, sonar activity, and status of the vehicle. I felt a little uneasy suddenly. The deepest I've ever been was 800 meters when looking for undetonated missiles, but the usual mission had us going no deeper than 200 meters. Well, here we go, Jackson announced, and the submersible went underwater leaving the rays of sun above us and engulfing the entire interior of the submersible in light blue. Gonna take us a little while to reach him, he said. The descent is always slower. I stared out the glass panel, seeing a school of fish scurry away from our position. As we descended, sunlight rapidly started to fade away and the light blue color which surrounded us was very quickly being replaced with a progressively darker one. Look on the bright side, Jackson smiled. At least we won't be going to the abyssal zone. Well, let's just hope the crew members made it. I'd hate to be in their position right now, stuck at the bottom of the ocean in complete darkness, not knowing if rescue's coming or not. I shuddered at the thought. Jackson shrugged. Well, if they manage to put their deep diving suits on, they should be fine. Those can go even deeper than the sub. That situation didn't seem any more appealing than the one I had just mentioned. Being at the bottom of the ocean with... God knows what lurking around. Tons of pressure that can crush you in a second and no way to get back up, being forced to wait for rescue. Cheer up. Maybe they managed to escape on their submersibles and we just missed them, he said. It was getting so dark so fast and Jackson pressed a button to turn on the headlights, which illuminated our interior and the area in front, showing particles dancing across the beams. I glanced at the depth modulator and noticed that we were at 280 meters. The dark blue color quickly became black and all we could see outside was the part of the ocean which was illuminated by the headlights. Any remaining sea life that was seen up until that point was long gone now, and I thought about the creatures who lived in such eternal and consuming darkness, devoid of all light, except for the ones produced by themselves. 570 meters, 580 meters... We continued. The increasing numbers on the depth modulator painfully reminded me that we were putting ever-increasing distance between ourselves and the surface, descending deeper into the unexplored abyss with every passing second. The darkness surrounding us seemed thick, and our lights barely penetrated enough to see in front of ourselves. 
The pressure at this depth would be enough to crush us within seconds, and the only thing protecting us from that was the heavy glass on the submersible. I tried not to think about it as we descended deeper. 900 meters now. Jackson was quiet. I wondered if he felt as uneasy as I did. But if he did, he was hiding it pretty well. I saw a faint light from a deep sea creature bobbing up and down in the distance before it disappeared out of our sight. Think it's an anglerfish? Jackson remarked. I'd love to see an anglerfish in person. Did you know they actually grow up to be larger than the average human? Oh yeah? I indulged him, even though I was really just trying to stay focused on the mission. Yeah, that's right. And here I thought up until recently that it was like something you can keep in your aquarium home, he chuckled. 1,500 meters now. We're close now, Jackson said. The bottom can't be more than 400 meters away, so chances are we'll find the sub there. Well, keep your eyes peeled then. In a matter of minutes, we finally saw something else besides the dark water. Hold up, we're here, I pointed through the glass to the flat sandy ground illuminated in front of us by our headlights. All right, sub should be around here then. Jackson steered the submersible in the direction of the little dot on the radar and we slowly started moving in that direction. No sonar activity, he said. That's not good. We squinted our eyes desperately trying to look past the short range of illuminated area of our headlights, trying to spot any signs of debris, but there was nothing but a desolate ground which seemed to stretch endlessly in front of us. And then all of a sudden we saw it. It came out of nowhere so suddenly that we almost crashed into it, a huge military submarine, just sitting on the ground. That doesn't look good, Jackson remarked. Let's take a look at the damage. He steered around the sub and it became apparent that it sank due to some serious external damage. The hull looked like some animal had literally chewed its way in, making a gaping hole in it. Holy Christ, man, what the fuck happened here? Jackson all of a sudden became very serious. What, what is this, a big animal or something? It looks like some of the submersibles ejected, so at least they made it that far. He steered the submersible above and over to the other side of the sub and then abruptly stopped. We both stared at the site in front of us in disbelief. The sub was sitting right at the edge of a cliff which dropped into more endless darkness below, stretching as far as our lights allowed us to see. I thought this was the bottom. I looked at Jackson. Uh, yeah, I, I did too. And that's what the commander said. He was staring at the crater now. Just then, a loud beeping sound came from inside our submersible, and I nearly crapped my pants, thinking we suffered some damage or had an incoming threat. Oh, that can't be right, Jackson said. What is it? Now there's a distress signal coming from one of the submersibles from the sub. All right, well, let's go find him then. I started to relax a little bit, knowing we weren't in any immediate danger. Jackson then looked at me. His facial expression told me what he was about to say wasn't good news. It's coming from 800 meters below us. What? What the fuck is he doing down there? I asked, baffled. I don't know. Jackson shook his head. But whatever it is, he ain't safe down there. His submersible can go down some, but not that deep. He must be in his suit down there. Well, we gotta help him. As much as I hated myself for saying that, I knew we couldn't just leave him. Nah, man, we should contact HQ for backup first, at least. Well, there's no time. It could take us a while to find him, and he's running out of oxygen with God knows what's down there. We need to go down there now. Jackson just stared at me. All right. All right, fine. Let's go. Jackson sighed and, with brief hesitation, started steering the submersible directly downwards. To say I was completely scared shitless was an understatement. Here we were, diving deeper into the midnight zone, where barely any creatures ventured, let alone humans. It all made me feel so small and vulnerable, being in such an inhospitable place to mankind. There's a good reason why we can't swim all the way down here with our technology, I thought to myself, staring into the abyss before me. Check this out. Jackson shook me back to reality. He pointed to the sonar which showed no activity. On the one hand, it put me at rest, but on the other hand, it made me worry about that missing person who sent the distress call. You see this circle on the sonar? Jackson pointed to a ring in the outer layer. That shows potential threats like walls and rocks we can run into. Okay, but it's circular, and it's all around us, I replied. Precisely. 
and it appeared as soon as we descended below the cliff, Jackson responded. Fuck me. This isn't a cliff at all. It's a sinkhole, I gasped. Yep, it is. What the fuck was the S-158 doing here? I muttered. We were approaching the depth of 2,300 meters now. Nothing changed visually compared to the previous 1,000 meters, but we still felt uneasy being so far below the surface. We should have seen some life by now, Jackson spoke. There's supposed to be all sorts of sea life detected on the sonar, but there's nothing. Not even the tiny creatures. It's very strange. Well, maybe this is a predator's territory, or used to be, I said. When we approached around 2,500 meters in depth, we started to notice a very faint red light blinking in the distance below us. That's it. That's our guy for sure, Jackson said and sped up the submersible. The red light would flicker on and off intermittently every second as we got closer. It grew in brightness. When we were close enough to the light to identify the source, we stopped. Holy shit, Jackson said as we stared at the busted submersible, which unmistakably belonged to the crew from S-158. It lay sideways on the floor. The glass was completely shattered and the command console broken. And then I caught something else at the corner of my eye. Every time the beacon would flicker, it would illuminate something on the ground close to the vehicle. Jackson steered our vehicle in that direction and then stopped again, audibly gasping. Damn it, I grunted at the sight in front of us. A body of a dead man in a deep diving suit lay before us. He was missing an arm and a leg and his torso was half eaten. The helmet was cracked open and his eyes stared blankly in shock. We're too late, I shook my head. Well, he has a camera on him. Let's see if it has any valuable info, Jackson said and maneuvered the sub closer. He pressed some buttons and used what we call the hand to extend a robotic hand from the bottom of the sub and controlled it clumsily until he managed to grab the camera off the soldier's chest and retract the hand inside. Once the water drained, I opened the panel at the bottom and retrieved the device. I plugged it inside the console and a video started playing. The camera followed a man from first-person perspective on a submarine which was breached, frantically running and panting while screams of his crew members were heard in the background. He jumped inside a submersible, closed the hatch, and quickly ejected himself into the water, muffling the dying screams behind. He steered his vehicle upward as a ferocious screech followed, and the screech could not be from anyone human. Then, for a split second, we saw something huge swim across his view in front of the submersible before disappearing out of sight. The soldier gasped loudly and his breathing became even more shallow. He glanced at the depth modulator, which was rapidly decreasing from 1,400 meters. He was reaching the surface. But then there was a loud crash, which shook his entire vehicle and almost knocked him off of his seat. His sub stopped moving and instead started to sink slowly. No, come on, not now, he shouted and frantically slammed buttons as multiple warning messages appeared on the console screens. The sub couldn't start. Fuck, he slammed his fist on the keyboard. The depth modulator was rapidly increasing now, 1300, 1500, 1700. More and more warning messages kept popping up, and as a last resort, the soldier entered a command on the keyboard to send a distress call. The creature which hunted him was practically toying with him, swimming around his vessel, growling and hissing. We couldn't see anything except an enormous fishtail which would pop in and out of view occasionally. In seconds, the creature disappeared completely and could not be seen nor heard. The soldier stood up and peered out the window looking for the creature. But then, something worse happened. A crack appeared on the glass in front of him. The soldier recoiled as the depth modulator screamed warnings about being deeper than deemed safe, but before he even had time to react, more cracks appeared and the entire glass burst open, filling the inside of the submersible with water. There was a lot of tumbling upside down, and before we realized what was going on, the soldier was out of the vehicle and dropping uncontrollably into his inevitable demise, with nothing visible around him. The next few seconds were filled with footage of him staring down at the black nothingness under his feet, as he forcibly sank deeper and deeper, panting and desperately flailing his arms and legs to slow down his fall. My stomach turned in knots as I watched him fall for what seemed like hours. Soon, though, his feet finally touched the lifeless ground and he collapsed softly to the floor. He looked at his surroundings hyperventilating and desperately tried to find something other than the darkness surrounding him. 
The submersible's beacon appeared in his view soon, and with a loud crash, it touched the ground, not too far from him. He started to inhale and exhale in a controlled manner, stabilizing his breathing. As he took slow steps towards the now useless submersible, he spoke finally in a somewhat calm manner. If anyone finds this, I'm Captain Conley of the S-158. My entire crew is dead and I'm the only survivor. And probably not for long. We ventured down here for a mission, but instead found something much worse. We woke it up from this forsaken sinkhole, and now it's out there after us. This is a warning to anyone who finds this recording. Seal the sinkhole and bury this creature in it. Tell all units and explorers to stay the fuck away from this place as far as possible. If this thing ever sees the light of day, we'll suffer far greater casualties than just one crew. A soft growl resounded from nearby and Conley spun around just in time to see something for a second before it lunged at him. I couldn't get a good look at it, but whatever I saw in that split second did not match the description of any deep sea life I had ever seen before. The remaining few seconds of the footage were a black screen filled with Conley screams and the creature's rabid biting, and then everything went silent and still. Jackson and I turned and looked at each other in disbelief. I was about to tell him to get us the fuck out of there and back to topside, to which he agreed, but then he looked at the sonar and cursed. I jerked my head towards it and let out a son of a bitch myself. There was one huge dot on the radar, and it was heading straight for us. Get us out of here, Jackson. Double time, I shouted. Are you crazy? There's no way we're going to outrun that thing. Look at the speed it's moving at, Jackson pointed to the sonar. The red dot was getting closer by the second. Then fire the decoy, I yelled. Well, no, no, we can't do that. We wanted to get close enough for that, remember? He turned off the headlights, instantly engulfing us in total darkness, except for our cockpit, which had the console buttons and screens glowing. What are you doing? I asked. The red dot was no more than 300 meters away from us now, and it was moving at an insane speed. We need to lure it away from us, Jackson responded, and having our lights on won't help with that. 200 meters now. A vicious scream echoed all around us, which without a doubt meant that the beast had sensed us and was coming after us making the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight. It felt discouraging knowing that the only thing that protected us from the inhospital waters and the deadly predator was the tiny cockpit that we were confined to. Unlike Connolly, we had no deep diving suits on board, so if our submersible got breached, we were going to die instantly. I remembered Captain Connolly falling helplessly into the abyss and being stuck in complete darkness without any help, and I almost felt relief for a second at the thought of an instant death from the pressure. The shriek was so loud now that my ears hurt. Jackson slammed a button and instantly a flashing decoy was fired from the vehicle, moving at a high speed while emitting a low beeping sound. For a brief second, before the decoy disappeared too far out of our line of sight, we saw a huge fishtail illuminated brightly before being devoured by darkness again. I glanced at the sonar and realized that the dot was now moving away from us. All right, take us up very slowly. I said to Jackson, squinting my eyes through the impregnable dark. Jackson turned our sub around to avoid even the console lights from attracting that thing and very slowly started descending. Even moving slowly, the submersible's engine made an alarmingly loud noise. Still though, seeing the depth modulator's numbers decrease slowly lifted our spirits, despite knowing we were nowhere near safe grounds. I grabbed the radio while Jackson operated the sub in pitch dark. HQ, come in. I radioed and held my breath for a reply. This is HQ. What's your position? The voice over the radio crackled with life, but kept cutting out. You cut out, HQ. Repeat. Another sentence filled with static and no audible words ensued. HQ, repeat, I said. But all we got was more static. Shit. I shook my head. Signal might be affected in the sinkhole. I'll try again when we're out of this. We were at 1,700 meters and going up. In just a matter of minutes, we were out of the godforsaken sinkhole and way past the busted sub. We started to relax and Jackson even turned the lights back on. That was a huge mistake, though, because the moment he did, there was an ear-piercing scream coming from below us. Oh, fuck. Go, 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 I yelled, and Jackson put the sub into full speed, practically sticking our backs onto the seats. 
The dot appeared on the radar again, and it was closing in fast. We were still a whole kilometer from the surface, and there was no way we could outrun that thing. The scream stopped, but were replaced by the sounds of something massive ripping its way through the water. Something crashed on the side of our vehicle, knocking me out of my chair. A humanoid hand with clawed fingers appeared at the edge of the glass, making a scratch mark on it. And then, the whole creature came into visibility right in front of us. It was smaller than we anticipated, but far more terrifying than I could have ever imagined. It almost looked human, with a head that resembled that of our own species, except for two tiny holes where the nose should have been. It had a humanoid neck, torso, and even arms. Its entire body was pale, but muscular. Its eyes were completely black, and despite not having pupils, I could tell it was looking straight at me, hissing and showing off sharp rows of teeth. The thing shook our submersible violently, making Jackson and me tumble up and down in the cockpit. Warning messages started popping up on screens, and I heard the distinctive sound of glass cracking. This is it, I thought. We're going to die down here, and we're going to end up just like Conley. But in all that mess, Jackson somehow managed to slam the decoy button, which launched another distraction. The creature shielded its face from the bright light of the decoy and then went after it, slapping our submersible's already damaged glass with its enormous fishtail along the way. Jackson sat up at the sub and sped up again. That was our last decoy. Jackson shouted, gripping the controls so firmly that veins were bulging violently from his hands. I glanced at the sonar and realized the creature was coming back for us again. Come on, baby, come on, Jackson yelled at the vehicle. Darkness dissipated and the water was gradually becoming blue, illuminating more and more in front of us, and never in my life have I ever been so relieved to be out of that goddamn darkness. Before we knew it, the vehicle popped out of the water so violently it practically jumped and then dove back into the water, making us slam our heads forward. We then looked at the sonar. No activity from the creature. Now, it looks like it might be gone, Jackson said. Yeah, well, we'd be best not to wait for it to return. We sped up back to HQ, glancing at the sonar every few seconds to make sure that thing wasn't following us. The next few hours were a blur, explaining to HQ what we had witnessed and how the entire S-158 crew was dead being questioned by higher-ranking officers and even men in suits, and eventually signing some papers about not speaking about what we saw to anybody. The sinkhole itself was apparently sealed with explosives, but that's all the info I managed to get from my commander. Jackson and I were forced to take a short leave after that and were forbidden from asking any questions related to the mission and the creature we encountered down there. But then, a few months later I decided that I did deserve some answers so I barged into the commander's office demanding information. Look, sir, I'm not leaving until you tell me what S-158 was looking for all the way down there and what the hell that thing was. The commander sighed from his chair. After a long pause, he simply said, It was a cryptid mermaid. What? I frowned. That thing was a cryptid mermaid, he repeated, the mythical creatures which sailors have been sighting for centuries. I chuckled at him, but then I realized he was serious. He stood up and turned his back to me, looking outside the window. The S-158 had a mission to investigate the sinkhole and bring back any intel they could find. There were sounds coming from the hole. Crew members described it as singing, so they went down to investigate, but instead, it turned out to be home to that creature. They usually stay down pretty deep, so it's strange that they came to the top of the sinkhole to attack the sub. They, my eyes widened in shock. The commander turned to me. Yeah, that's right. We've been studying them for a while now, and the higher-ups agree they're too dangerous to engage, so orders are to avoid them at all costs. They're real, and that's all I know. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got some work to do. Commander, I dismissed, Private. He slammed his palm on the table, and I knew there was no point in arguing. I often wake up at night thinking about that fateful moment, when the cryptid creature decided to go after the decoy instead of finish us off. I see its black eyes and pale features with a facial expression that's so hateful it can rip through metal. I often wonder what would have happened had it decided that we were more interesting as prey instead of the decoy. Would we end up half-eaten like Conley, rotting at the bottom of the ocean? Never in my life could I imagine something like this. 
that these things are fucking real. But something far more terrifying keeps me up at night, and I can't help but wonder whenever I try to drift into sleep and whenever I'm supposed to go back into the waters. How many of them actually are there? <laughs>